All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with this exam review. So today we're going to be going over the 2021 exam. My name is Hamza Awan, and uh, yeah, so uh, this is the blank exam. If anyone else needs it, if you could like raise your hand real quick, otherwise I can, I'll move on. All right, so we're going to start uh, with the nomenclature section. So a lot of Bean, all of Bean's exams pretty much follow the same format. Uh, for the first exam, you're only going to have two sections. You're going to have the nomenclature section and the um, fact section. The fact section is going to consist of the majority of your points. And our nomenclature section, this is going to be a staple for every single exam that you have. So it's very good to have like a good general knowledge of this and just like understand like what what we're trying to do with every step that with every step that we're doing. So for the first one. We start. Uh, so our first step to uh, our first step to start the naming uh, is we're going to find the longest chain. So whenever we're finding the longest chain, we want the longest chain of carbons, but also be able to choose the chain that has the most substituents. So in this, for example, we can have a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbon chain like this, with only two substituents, right? But if we were going to uh, number it a different way, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you'll notice that it's the same. It's the same number of carbons on both of them. But this one has one, two, and three uh, substituents. So whenever we're numbering, we want to make sure that we pri uh, prioritize the length of the chain first, and then the number of substituents after. So uh, whenever now that we found the uh, the chain with the with the most substituents, it's important that we also make sure that the substituents are on the lowest number carbon. So uh, one thing, one way we can do this is that we can start counting backwards. So we'll start counting from seven. We'll put one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you'll notice in the blue numbering we have substituents at three, five, and six. So we just write that down three comma five comma six. Oh, damn, that was a terrible six. And then uh, with the purple, we have substituents on carbon two, carbon three, and carbon five. So uh, which one would we be using over the um, purple, right? So uh, we're gonna, I'll erase the blue numbering so that we can focus on the purple. And so now we know we have substituents on two, five, and uh, three. So uh, the substituents on carbon two, uh, they're a single carbon in length. So who can tell me what uh, what that's called uh, as a substituent? Methyl, exactly. So uh, on carbon two and five, we have two methyls. So um, remember, whenever we're naming uh, carbons, uh, we go from how many carbons it has. So we're going to, uh, one carbon chains is going to be methyl. And then we have two carbon, uh, ethyl or ethane, I guess, methane, ethane, uh, and then propane. Uh, then we have, um, wow, propane, and then butane, uh, pentane. And so on, right? But whenever we have substituents, we drop the ane and add the L. So we do minus ane plus YL. So this methane becomes methyl, ethane, ethyl, propane, propyl, butane, butyl, and pentane, pentyl. So uh, you're supposed to know all up to 10. So pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, and decane. So make sure that uh, you guys do know that. Uh, for this, we have uh, one thing. The first thing I like to do is just uh, find out which substituents we have. So on two and five, we've already established that we have two methyl groups. So we can write just like subs right here. Uh, two comma five dash methyl. Uh, since we have two methyls, do, does anyone know the uh, prefix that we're going to put behind that? Die. Perfect. So we're going to call that 2,5-dimethyl. 
And then that's going to be our naming for those two uh, methyl groups. And now on carbon three, uh, we have a two carbon chain. Who can tell me what that is? Ethyl, perfect. So on car uh, carbon three, we can just write three dash ethyl. Since we just have one, we're not going to put anything behind that. So now we can put it all together. So remember, whenever we're naming, we want to start with the lowest. Um, we we want to start alphabet in alphabetical order. So whenever we look at this, uh, we're not going to take di into account. We're going to put the M first. So we have methyl and ethyl. So which one is going to go first? Ethyl, right. So whenever we, whenever we start, we're going to put 3 dash ethyl dash 2 comma 5 dimethyl. And now we have to find the parent chain. So whenever we have a seven carbon chain, if we count, we have a uh, hex. Uh, for, so from right here, pentane, then we have hexane and for six carbon, and then uh, heptane for seven carbon. So this is going to be our parent chain. So our parent is heptane. Remember, since it's our parent chain, we're not going to uh, add the ane, drop, uh, might subtract the ane, add the ill. We're just going to put heptane since it's just the parent. So our compound is going to be named 3 ethyl 2 5 dimethyl heptane. And because we don't have any stereochemistry to worry about, that's going to be our uh, name. Uh, any questions on that? All right, uh, going forward. Um, we have uh, a cyclopropane and a, oh, sorry, I didn't want to say that actually, my bad. For, forget I said that. All right, so we're going to start with numbering again. Uh, so we have two, uh, we can number it this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But notice that we only have a seven carbon chain on this. Whereas if we numbered it from this way, this uh, from this bottom part, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we get eight carbons in the chain. So we're gonna be going with the purple numbering for now. Now it's always good practice to check your numbering, sorry, backwards and forwards. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So in this one, both of them have two substituents. Uh, purple numbering has substituents on four and five, and so does the green. Uh, green. So, and then purple has four and five. So because we have two substituents on both, uh, that means we have to go to our next uh, step of finding out which one has priority. So that is going to be through um, our through uh, alphabetical order. So whenever we check alphabetical order, we have a uh, we have to look at our substituents before. So we have two substituents right here. So this substituent, uh, this two carbon substituent, we've already established this in ethyl. And then uh, this three carbon substituent, this is a cyclopropyl. Yes. Uh, Lily, do we have, we don't have a paper copy, unfortunately. Uh, if you, do you want the. Is it this way I can try to ice while I'm working? Pro, like uh, if there's any outlets over there, like uh, just around the room, I think. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Uh, and then, so between that, we have an ethyl and a cyclopropyl. So whenever we look at this, we want to look at which one has, uh, which one comes first in the alphabet. So we start with, we have C versus E. So cyclopropyl is going to be first in the alphabet, which means that we want the cyclopropyl to be on the lower number. So that means we have to use the green numbering. So I'll erase the purple. And we'll focus on the green. So we know on carbon four. Or we have a cyclopropyl group. And on carbon five, we have an ethyl group. Uh, we don't have any stereochemistry, but now uh, we can. <coughs> now we can find the parent chain. So our parent chain. Is eight carbons long. So for an eight carbon chain, we would go one more after heptane. So after heptane, we have octane. So octane. 
and we're not going to uh, do anything to it. It's our parent chain, so it's going to stay like this. So now whenever we put it all together, we're going to start with the uh, cyclo and then ethyl. So whenever we're naming it, so 4 dash cyclopropyl dash 5 dash ethyl dash or not dash, sorry, octane. And make sure that whenever you guys do do this um, section that uh, we keep this all in one word. So all of these nomenclature names are all going to be one word. It's okay if you have like some slight bit of space just to show that like there's separate and uh, separate parts, but make sure you don't leave too much of a space that it can be misinterpreted for it being uh, in two words, right? So that's just an easy way to like make sure that you don't lose points. Uh, are there any questions on uh, B? No. Okay. So. The next one, we have a uh, chair structure of cyclohexane. So whenever we have this, uh, it's important that we uh, draw it out regularly. Uh, so what I like to do, I just like having it in a, um, a line format rather than having the actual CH, like the CH2s like this, because it gets kind of confusing for me. I'd rather just uh, count, you know, corners. So whenever we draw it on a cyclo, we notice that we have two uh, two things. This is an equatorial position. This is an axial position. But uh, more importantly, this one, both of them are pointing down. So whenever they're pointing down, uh, does anyone know what that what kind of bond they'd be on? Yes, cis, right? But also, uh, I was gonna say like, what kind of um, orientation would they be on on this cyclohexane right here? It'd be on, it'd be on a dash. I don't, I don't know. If so down, if you see down on the chair structure, they're going to be on a dash. So we're going to draw it with a dash on both both of those. So both of those are going to be on dashes. If this was instead, if this CH two three CH three was on this like this, this would be a wedge. Does that make sense? Like uh, depending on the way it's oriented, it'll tell you which uh like the way it's connected to the uh, bond. <clears throat> so we have two uh, dash dash groups. So our first dash group is a CH2 CH. So we'll draw our CH2 CH. And then that CH has a methyl coming off CH3. And then we go back to that CH and we can put another CH. And then that one has two CH3s hanging off of it. So it's going to look like that. So whenever we look at this, we have one, two, three, four carbons and two methyl groups hanging off. If we look at this, we have one, two, three, four carbons, and then one methyl group, and then the second methyl group hanging off is that two. So we are counting one of those in uh, in this dot structure. So we, um, you know, we only have one of those that were that we didn't count, and that's what we just counted. And then on to the next one. So do we have a CH two three CH three? So that just means we have three carbons and then a methyl like and then a just an ending group. So we have one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four. So this is going to be our CH two CH two CH two CH three. So that's perfect. So this is the structure of the uh, molecule that we have. Now uh, make sure whenever we're numbering cyclohexanes, it's very important that we uh, that we know that the numbering can start from anywhere. For example, we can start the numbering from here. Or we can start the numbering from here like that. What we want to do for cyclohexane is that we always want to put the higher prior, the, the bigger group on the lower number. But in this case, we're going to, uh, since the groups are of like similar, uh, because they're both four carbon groups, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be checking their, um, their alphabetical order. So now we have uh, this this top group, which is corresponding to uh, this top one right here. So this is going to be uh, one, two, three, four. So it's a butyl group, but it has two methyls hanging off on carbons two and carbons three. So we have a two comma three dash dimethyl butyl.
So this is important. This is a uh, complex, um, what is it, substituent? Complex substituent, which means that this is going to go in parentheses. And so uh, this is just the two threes. That's essentially just telling us that the two three is denoting that the methyls are going to be inside of the uh, substituent, not on the cyclohexane. That's the only reason we put the parentheses there, just so that we have those separated. So we have a two three dimethyl butyl, and then on the uh, the other uh, the other group, this is a four carbon chain. So this is just going to be a butyl. So now if we look at this and we look at which one has a uh, naming priority, we can look at this B for butyl and then we skip the dye and we look at this methyl. So we have butyl versus methyl. So we know that butyl is going to come first and methyl is going to come afterwards. So we can start numbering like this. So one, two, three, four, five, and six, which means the butyl is going to be on one and the uh, two, three dimethyl butyl is going to be on carbon two. So now uh, we pretty much have everything that we need. We know uh, that because this is, this is a chair structure of uh, a six carbon ring. I, I know I said it before, but does anyone remember what, uh, what it, that's called? One more time. Cyclohexane, perfect. So our parent chain is a cyclohexane. Remember, every time we have a closed ring, we always add the cyclo and then the hex uh, and then however many carbons it would be. So for this, we have the cyclo because this is a ch closed structure and then hexane because it's a six carbon structure. Uh, it's just con con all in one. And now, lastly, we do have stereochemistry for this problem because as you can see, we see these, uh, uh, we see the dashes. So because they're both on dashes, uh, I know you said it earlier, but does anyone else know what we're going to be calling that in terms of it's the uh, cyclohexane stereochemistry? Cis, perfect. So we know that the stereo is cis. So now whenever we put it all together, we can start. We start with the stereochemistry. So we start with cis. Then we uh, put our substituents, one dash butyl, dash two, uh, two parentheses, two comma three dash dimethyl butyl cyclohexane. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yeah. That's actually, that'll come in later in the lecture. I think, uh, I didn't exactly get it confused, but there is uh, one thing that we wanna make sure that we have a bigger one on a certain position. And I'll, I'll go over that later in the lecture. There's another question on that. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, the parentheses? Yeah. Yeah, so the 2,3-dimethylbutyl is going to be the complex substituent. That's this substituent right up here, right? But this, since it's just a, like, four-carbon chain, uh, and since it's a substituent, it's just going to be uh, just straight butyl. Like, butane, and then drop the ane, add the ale. It's just a, just a butyl. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, usually, whenever you have stereochemistry, so in this... Uh, whenever you have stereochemistry for your guys' exam, you're going to see da uh, dashes or uh, wedges. Yeah, axio, axitorio, and dashes and wedges. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So cis is meaning that they're both on the same uh, orientation. And then trans, they would be on opposite orientations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So one up, one down. Yeah. For part B, four cyclopropyl. What? Okay, so uh, whenever we have substituents, uh, it's, even for cyclo substituents, we uh, it's it's still a substituent, right? So we're gonna always drop the ane at the ill for the cyclos, even for cyclos.
Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, yes, there should. My bad. Uh, anyone else? All right. Uh, we're going to move to D. So on D, uh, we have a. Do you have extras? Uh, we have a QR code, I think, if you'd like to scan that. Yeah, no worries. So uh, for D, uh, in this question, we have to draw the uh, molecule. So we have a cis, one isobutyl, three tert pencil, uh, pencil cyclopropensane. So uh, we get, what I like to do is start with the uh, cyclo, uh, with the parent chain. And then, um, so we have our cyclopentane, which is the like pentagon. Then um, we know that we have a one isobutyl and three tert cyclopentanes, uh, three tert pentyl. So um, what I like to do in this is to draw out what kind, what groups I have. So we know that the isobutyl is going to be looking something like this. So we have a single carbon, then another one, and then it ha it splits off into two CH3s. You need it? Here, I can move up real quick. Okay, um, so this is gonna be our isobutyl group. Then uh, we have a T-pentyl group, which is going to look like this. So uh, we're going to have uh, two CH3 groups coming off of the first carbon. So that's already three of our carbons. And then we're going to have our fourth carbon and our fifth carbon. So that is our T-pentyl. Now, uh, whenever we're drawing it, we know that they're going to be in a cis conformation. So if we're going to do this, if we just started counting one, two, three, four, five, because they're going to be in a cis, uh, what we have to do whenever we draw it, we need to make sure they're both on wedges or they're both on dashes. So it doesn't matter how you do it, just as long as they're both the same. Does that make sense? So just because it's cis doesn't mean that you have to do dashes or wedges in particularly. You can, you can choose whichever one you want to do. Both of them would work fine. Just make sure that they're both the same for cis. And if it said trans, it doesn't matter which one you put on the wedge. Just know that one of them has to be a wedge. One of them has to be a dash. Uh, the numbering has to be the same. Oh, yeah. The way I'm numbering it is just uh, based on just ease of ease. Yeah. So now uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose to do dashes. So now we have a cis-1 isobutyl. So on, on the carbon-1, we have this group. <laughs> so that's going to be our first carbon. So that's uh, what this dot corresponds to is right here. What was that? Zoom in. What? Zoom in. Oh, my fault. Okay. So uh, this dot is corresponding to this carbon right here. So uh, I'm going to add a CH and a CH3, CH3. So CH, CH3, CH3. So that's our T, uh, isobutyl group. And then on this other wedge, we're going to have our T pencil group. So like this, one, two, one, two. So that's our T butyl group, right? Uh, T pencil group, sorry. And that's going to be our structure for this. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So we just have to make sure that we draw the parent chain and then draw the groups on top of the parent chain in the correct confirmation. Yes. Yeah. If it was dashes, this wedge would just be just change, like just dash. Yeah, like this, this confirmation that's on the screen right here, this is trans, right? Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, you have to draw it in the box. Yes, uh, if you want credit, you're gonna draw it in the box. Uh, any other questions before we move on to facts? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, I can do it. Do you mind if I do that after the lecture? Yeah, no worries. Okay, yeah. Uh, any anyone else? Okay. Uh, yeah, I I feel like it just take a little bit too long, and I think a lot of people are. I mean, it's kind of late for a lot of people as well. I don't wanna. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll do it after though for sure. So uh, so going on to the facts. So the first thing we have, it's asking us to calculate the formal charge for the indicated atoms. So whenever you're calculating formal charge, remember that formal charge uh, is going to be our valence electrons minus the number of bonds that we have and lone pairs. Uh, plus, well, not lone pairs, but uh, electrons that we have on the thing. So it'd be lone pairs times two, I guess. Right? So that's what we have for our formal charge equation. If we put it, uh, if we use it for all of these, um, for oxygen, uh, oxygen is, uh, it has six valence electrons, right? So whenever we look at this, we have our six valence electrons minus however many bonds that we have, one, two, three. And then we have our single lone pair, which is gonna be multiplied by two. So that's gonna be one times two. So it's two. So six minus one, two, three, four, five. So whenever we have six minus five, we have a positive one charge remaining. So for oxygen, we're gonna put plus one. And now boron, uh, we have a BF3. So boron has um, three uh, valence electrons. So because boron has three, we know that uh, if we draw this out, boron is bonded to this oxygen, which has three fluorines on it. We have four bonds on the boron, but it has three valence electrons. So we would do three minus four. And that's going to come out to minus one. So this boron has a minus one charge. Uh, going on, we have a carbon. Uh, carbon in this has uh, four valence electrons. And remember, valence electrons uh, is going to be based on the, the vertical group that the uh, element would be in. So it, it boron, then carbon has, boron has three, carbon four, nitrogen five, oxygen six, uh, fluorine seven, and so on. Right. So whenever we have carbon, we have four. Then this carbon is going to be bonded to two CLs. So we have two CL bonds and then we have the lone pair. So whenever we have uh, the whenever we count the amount of valence electrons, we have four minus the number of bonds, which is going to be one, two and then the lone pair. So this is going to be one and two. So each electron is worth one in the lone pair. So four minus four, that's going to be zero. Right. <laughs> and our last one, we have a CH2 uh, bonded to N, true bond N. So our CH2, uh, this one is very advantageous to draw out just because, just in case there's a small mistake. Because we have, in this one, we although we have an octet, we have, uh, it doesn't sh look like it, but it, we actually have five bond, uh, five things on our carbon. Right, or not five, but it, uh, from what it looks like, we have only two bonds on our carbon, like this, the CH two. But we actually have a third. Um, we have a third bond with the nitrogen right here, and it looks like just if we look at this structure, it looks like it's bonded to the hydrogen, but it's actually bonded to the carbon. So it's uh, it's important sometimes just to draw it out, make sure that you don't make any stupid mistakes. Then um, now we can count the. We know the number of valence electrons is four. And then whenever we count up the number of bonds, we have one, two, and three, and then we add the lone pair, one, two. So four minus five, and that's gonna give us a charge of negative one. This nitrogen, uh, remember it's carbon has four, so nitrogen has five valence electrons. So we're gonna start with five, and then this nitrogen has one bond to the carbon and then three bonds to another nitrogen. So that's gonna be a one, one, two, three. So that's four, four total. So five minus four, and that's going to give us a plus one charge on that nitrogen. Then we need to get the formal charge of this last nitrogen. Uh, this last nitrogen, uh, we know it has five valence electrons, and so it has three bonds to the other nitrogen. So we can say minus three 
but we also have the lone pair on it. So that's going to be 5 minus 3 minus 2, which is going to be 5 minus 5. And so this nitrogen has a charge of 0. So that was calculating formal charge. Does anyone have any questions on that? Nope. Okay. Beautiful. So number three, place the anions in order of increasing basicity. So whenever we're looking at basicity, we want to make sure that we're looking at the opposite of acidity, right? So the stronger the base, the weaker the acid. And uh, flipped, reverse. So the stronger the acid, the weaker the base. So we can look at it in the same way that we look at acidity, right? So whenever we look at this, we have a, um, we, get, we can look at cardio, C-A-R-D-I-O. So what, what we can, uh, what cardio stands for is charge, atom, resonance, dipole induction, And O for orbitals. Uh, but I don't think that you guys would have orbitals on the exam. It's just good to know that you do have orbitals. <laughs> so uh, in this question, it's asking us to place the anions in order of increasing basicity. So these anions, uh, this uh, oxygen, this nitrogen, and this sulfur. So uh, there are three things that we know. So all the charges are the same. So we don't have to worry about the C. Next, we have atom. So this is what this is what we're looking at. So we're looking at atoms because these have different atoms in there: the oxygen, the nitrogen, and the sulfur. So we have to determine which one is going to be uh, the most basic, least basic, and such. So remember that uh, whenever we have uh, increased electronegativity, we have a stronger uh, acid, right? So the more electronegative is a stronger acid, which makes it a weaker base, right? So by that logic, uh, oxygen is going to be the most electronegative, nitrogen the next, and then sulfur the least. So, so because sulfur is the least electronegative of the three atoms, and it's also, uh, from si if we look at it from the size point of view, size sulfur is a lot bigger. Right. So because sulfur is bigger, that means it has more acidity. It's uh, more or less acidic or sorry, it is more acidic. I'm tweaking more acidic. So because of that, it would be more acidic and less basic. And so we look at size first. And so sulfur is going to be our least basic uh, anion. Now we have the choice between oxygen and nitrogen. So whenever we look at this. We have to remember that the uh, because we have something which is um, whenever we uh, sorry whenever we're looking at this something that is going to be more electronegative is going to be a stronger acid and a weaker base. So between this, the oxygen is going to be a stronger acid, which is going to make it a weaker base, and so the nitrogen would be a stronger base. Does that make sense? So comparatively, the nitrogen is. Comparatively, the nitrogen is a uh, is a weaker has less electronegativity. Correct? Is that I'm I'm try, I want to like make sure there's no confusion right here because I, I know I'm going a little fast and it's like kind of so comparatively the nitro nitrogen is less electronegative, which means that it's going to be a weaker acid, and such a stronger base, and that's what we're looking at. So our nitrogen is going to be our most basic. And then our oxygen, which is more electronegative, is going to be a stronger acid, which makes it a weaker base. So this is going to be number two. Are there any questions on that? Does that, all that make sense? Yes. The charge atom, uh, resonance, dipole induction, and orbitals. Yes. Okay, yeah. So if we had a periodic table in front of us, like this, right? So uh, whenever we have electronegativity, 
electronegativity increases with this arrow across the periodic table. Size increases going down the periodic table in reference to this class. Excuse me? Uh, and this it would be. Even so, uh, the, um, the sulfur is less electronegative than the oxygen, right? So if we're going to go uh, with electronegativity going sideways, we have oxygen like this. We have uh, fluorine right here. And then we have our nitrogen right here. And right under oxygen is sulfur, right? And because electronegativity, as we go up, it's more electronegative. Even if we use the electronegativity, we'd still get the same, the same answer. I just wanted to make sure that uh, everyone knew about the size. Does that make sense? Yeah, so even with electronegativity, the sulfur would be less electronegative than both the nitrogen and the oxygen because it's bigger. Yeah. Oh, yes, in this case, yeah. Between them. Sorry about that. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, last, uh, not last. Wow. So next one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can try. Okay. So it's asking us to rank the following compounds in the order of the increasing boiling point. So whenever we have more branching, so in this, uh, we're looking at the amount of branching. Uh, that we have on the uh, carbons. So whichever one is has more branching, more branching, which essentially is just substituents. So the more substituents something has, it's going to decrease the boiling point. Right? So uh, if we were to look at all of these, just like as if we we're naming them, we have a one, two, three, four carbon structure with three substituents, six carbon structure with one substituent, and then a five carbon structure with two substituents. So we can just write three, one, two. That's just denoting the amount of substituents that we have. Now to, uh, to do it for a number of increasing boiling point, we're just gonna flip it around. So this three would have the lowest boiling point. So we're gonna put in the box one. And then for number one, we're going to have the uh, we're going to have the highest boiling point. So that's going to be number three. And the middle boiling point is going to be with number two. Uh, does all of that make sense? Yes. Yes. The, the middle one has the least branching. It only has one substituent on it. And so because of that, it has the lowest amount of branching, which causes it to have the highest boiling point. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the number outside was the number of substituents he had, each had. I was just uh, clarifying it for all of it. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she would do that, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, most of it, for this boiling point, it's usually just going to be substituents. Uh, yes. What was that? Yes, exactly. Yeah. One more time. Oh, when you should, uh, whenever, usually when you would consider uh, IMF intermolecular force. Okay, yeah. So whenever you would consider dipole induction is whenever we have a polar molecule. So that's going to be with like anything with oxygen, with fluorine, that kind of thing. So anything that pulls electron density. So in this, we just have th uh, uh, three nonpolar molecules, right? Uh, any other questions? Yes.
Yeah, it's not gonna. My bad. Okay. No, no, no worries. I should explain that more. That's mine. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Uh, we can move on. So number five is asking us to draw all the structural isomers resulting from the monobromination of the compound below. So whenever we want, or whenever we look at this, the first thing that I like to look at is this word right here. So whenever we have monobromination, who can tell me what that means? One BRs, right, perfect. So we're adding one BR onto this compound. So if we want uh, isomers, we wanna make sure that we have three different isomers because in this, uh, we it says you will be penalized for duplicate structures. So we want all the different isomers that we can form. We don't wanna form any duplicates, otherwise we're gonna be penalized, right? So the first thing I notice, uh, if we were just gonna write this out, we have CH3 bonded to CH bonded to CH3 bonded to CH2 bonded to CH CH3 CH3. So, does anyone notice anything about this molecule? It's symmetrical. Perfect. So we see that this molecule is symmetrical down the center, right? So that means that uh, on each side we have uh, on each side we have identical carbons. So what that means is that this carbon, this CH3 right here, is going to be the same as this carbon, this CH3, because they're both uh, on groups that are attached to a CH, right? And the same way as uh, on the other side, this CH3 and this CH3, they're all they're both the same as this carbon. Uh, they're both the same, uh, like with respect to each other, right? Like this. But then we also know that they're going to be the same across, right? So this CH3 and this CH3 are the same. This CH3, this CH3 are the same. So all these CH3s right here that we have, they're all going to be uh, just one uh, isomer structure. So the way this looks, the way that I like to do it is I like to um, make sure every single um, every single separate different carbon has a particular letter or number involved with it. So I'm gonna label all the carbons that are the same. So all these carbons we know are the same. And we're gonna label them all A. So A A A A. Then I'm gonna choose a different color, and we're gonna go to the next one. So on the same principle. This carbon and this carbon, this CH, are both the same. So these are both going to be B. And we only have a single, singular unique carbon uh, in, the in the middle. And that's going to be C. So C. So whenever we have monobromination, uh, we always want to show that there are three, uh, the amount, well, since we have A, B, and C, we know we have to show three different isomers. Right. If we put more, we're going to be penalized. So we only want to put one bromine on each. So one on A, one on B, one on C. And we have to. So we have to do that by showing three different structures. So this green structure is going to be showing it on A. So what we can just do is we can just draw an arrow and we can have our like this. We're just going to draw our regular compound and on any of the A's. It doesn't matter which one you choose, just on one of them. You choose one, you put a bromine on it. So that's our A done. Next, uh, we can put it on B. So this is going to look the same way. We're going to draw the structure. And then on, bro uh, on carbon B, we're going to put a bromine on it. It doesn't matter which one you put it on. Just make sure you put it on one of them. And then lastly, on carbon C, we have another one. Same, draw the structure. And then on carbon C, since there's only one carbon, there's only one place to put the bromine. So now we have three isomers, and these are going to be all of the. Uh, this is going to be all of the questions. So we've done our three monobrominations for all three separate carbons. Any questions? Yeah. Excuse me. One more time. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. It will. Yeah, it'll tell you how many isomers you have. So since we have A, B, and C, we have three different isomers. Yeah. Of course. Yep. The unsaturation number? Okay, yeah. So 
Uh, this is going to be a little bit separate. Uh, she asked how to, what's the calculation for unsaturation number. So uh, if you're asked about unsaturation number, the uh, equation is 2C plus 2 minus H minus O all, or I don't think it's, it's not minus O, uh, minus N, minus N. Uh, most of the time you won't have N, but uh, it's minus N. Or is it, is it plus, wait. Lily, real quick, is it plus n or minus n? Plus n, sorry. It's plus n all divided by 2. So this is going to be our unsaturation number. So that's a little bit separate, but yeah, that's the equation. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What is that? So uh, I think... Uh, I think she might ask you about like unsaturation number in your uh, exam. In case she does, that's just the equation of how to how to find it. Two times the number of carbons. Yeah, minus the number of uh, plus two minus the number of hydrogens. Plus the number of nitrogens. Yeah. Well, what does what say? Oh, this the unsaturation number. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh in this there wouldn't be uh i'm not sure if there's uh, yeah i i don't think she would i quiz uh yeah oh really so i i have to find like a example to like try to figure out but yeah, I mean, if they ask about geometric isomers, usually it's just going to be identifying which one is going to be a geometric 2022. Geometric. I think it'd be the same. It'd be the same thing. Then. The, same, the same way this is. I think it's just different wording then. Uh. There is, but I think in this context, you're, it's going to be the same answer. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. So uh, what the unsaturation number tells you is how many uh, double bonds there would be, right? So uh, usually it's just going to be, um, if she does ask you, it'll just be like, She'll just give you a formula like C6, H6, O, whatever, right? Uh, what you just have to do from that, if you just, you just have to remember this equation, plug it in, and then you just have a number. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on. So uh, for number six, it's asking us rate the compounds in order of increasing solubility and pentane. So whenever we're looking at solubility, we want to make sure that uh, we see that uh, what it's going to be um, dissolved into. So in this case, we have pentane. So if we look at this, pentane is a nonpolar molecule. So nonpolar. And what we know about nonpolar molecules is that only nonpolar um, solvents are going to be dissolved in them. So nonpolar dissolves, dissolves nonpolar, and polar dissolves polar. Okay, so now uh, we want to look for first the nonpolar compound in, in between these. So we have a um, uh, CH3, CH2O minus Na plus. So in this one, I'm going to make sure to put the O minus and A plus right here. This tells us that this is an ionic bond. Right. In this, in the next one, we have a, we have an uh, ether. So CH3 dash O ch2 ch3 so that's what an ether looks like it's kind of it's just like an oxygen in between two uh carbon groups and so in this one this is not going to be an ionic bond this would rather be a polar molecule <clears throat> and this last one uh cyclohexane this is a nonpolar compound 
So because this is completely nonpolar, we know that nonpolar is going to dissolve polar, uh, nonpolar. So our the most soluble is going to be our nonpolar cyclohexane. So this is going to be immediately number three. Now we have to look at between ionic bonds and polar molecules. So ionic bonds are bonds with actual charges on them. All polar molecules are just things that have some dipole induction and res uh, dipole induction throughout the molecule, right? So because ionic bonds, they have like full complete charges. That makes them a lot less likely to dissolve in nonpolar uh, nonpolar substances than a polar molecule. So because of that, our ionic bond compound is going to be our least soluble, and our polar molecule is going to be second least soluble. Uh, any questions on this? Yes. So uh, whenever we have ionic, uh, here. Whenever we have ionic, we have two particular charges, right? We have a minus charge and that plus charge, right? Together. Whenever we have a polar molecule, this oxygen is only pulling some electron density towards it, right? That's like dipole induction. That's causing these carbons to be partially positive, like partially positive. So partially positive would not be any, anywhere equivalent to an actual charge on it, which would make it a lot harder to dissolve. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. They're a lot stronger. They're a lot stronger charge. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, no, not not particularly. I mean, hydrogen bonds in this is just going to be hydrogen with oxygen or nitrogen, but that's just going to cause it to be polar, right? You're going to look at the uh, oxygen before you look at the hydrogen. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, this is just uh, like regular like acid-based chemistry. This is just uh, like whenever we see like a um, whenever we see a, a metal like this. We, uh, we know that it's not going to be covalently bonded. Like the sodium metal is not going to be covalently bonded. So the same way, like this polar molecule is covalently bonded to the carbons, right? But sodium can't do that. So that's why whenever we see sodium, we're going to assume that it's um, uh, charged, right? Yeah. Yeah. If they gave you a polar, if they was going to ask you something polar, it would be something like acetone or water. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. If it's asked water or acetone here, I'll, I'll, I'll write that out. Actually, that's a good point. So in water slash acetone. So both of these are polar molecules, right? So in this, this would just completely flip it. So our polar molecule would be number three. Our nonpolar would be number one, and then our ionic bond would actually be number two. But that's just because of the way the charges work, right? Yes. Oh, okay, no worries. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. It'd be based on the charge that's on the present on the molecule. So uh, if a if a molecule is charged, it's going to be ionic, and then if a, if it's not charged, you're going to assume that uh, if it has like an electronegative atom, it'd be partially positive, which would cause it to be polar. Does that make sense? Um, if we had uh something like uh. If we had an amine, say CH3 dash NH2 like this, uh, this is going to be also a polar molecule. It might not be as polar as this oxygen. It's going to be a little bit less polar, but it's still polar, right? So because it's less polar, if we had this instead of our, if we had this instead of our ionic bond, the uh, it would probably be, uh, and if we still had it in pentane. The numbering would probably be about, uh, so this would be number two. 
the oxygen would be number one, and then the nonpolar would be still number three. So is it would depend on the um the molecule that the that the dipole uh interaction is with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it was in pentane, then no. Then because it's stronger, it would have a higher um higher partially positive charges on the carbons, right? It would pull more electron density because it's more electronegative, which would cause it to be less soluble in nonpolar compounds. Yeah. Uh, okay. And uh, I'll move on to number seven. Predict the products that would result in the acid-based reaction between the compounds below and place the answers in the boxes provided. Indicate the direction of equilibrium by placing a single arrow on the box. So in this, we have an acid, uh, we have acid based chemistry. So uh, the easiest part of this problem is just finding out the products of the reaction. So the way we can do that, we can just see, we see that this oxygen has a minus charge on it. So what it's going to want to do is going to want to attract a proton. So that proton could be found on this, um, on this uh, alcohol right here. So this uh, hydrogen, uh, this oxygen now wants to take that hydrogen. So it, uh, that minus charge wants to pull that hydrogen. And we can show that by putting this arrow. And then this hydrogen, sorry, this hydrogen is bonded to the oxygen. And so we can show that bond breaking just by showing that the electron density, uh, the electrons that the hydrogen has are just going straight to the oxygen. So now we have one of our, we have both of our products pretty much. So our first product, I'm going to draw the CF3 first. So we have a CF3, CH2O, and remember this O just took that hydrogen. So it's now going to be instead of an O minus Na plus, we have an OH. And conversely, this CH3, CH2O is going to uh, sw swap places with the uh, sodium. So this uh, CH3, CH2, we now have an O minus here, right? So we show the O minus because this hydrogen uh, dumped its electrons back into that oxygen, causing it to have a negative charge. And we show that this uh, sodium wants to go there. So this sodium is going to be Na plus right here. So these are going to be our two products. For now to draw an arrow. So whenever we're drawing an arrow, we want to draw from strong to weak. So strong points at weak. OK. So whenever we're looking at this, we want to find out which one is going to be a strong base, which one's going to be a strong acid, which one's going to be a weak base, which one's going to be a weak acid. Right. And it's going to be the same thing that we do with cardio. So if we look at this in uh, the eyes of cardio. Um, uh, C, A, R, D, I, O. Uh, all we have to look at is uh, the thing I like to look at uh, most is the base, uh, the base. So the base is easily determined by the one that has the charge on it, right? So this CF3, CH2, O minus Na plus, this one is, so I'll put, I'll use base in green. So this is going to be our base. So, and this, uh, this last one is also going to be our base. So we have two bases right here and then our acid, I'll put it in red. So we have two acids and two bases, right? So now all we have to do is figure out which one is stronger. So between the two bases, the charges are the same. The atoms, though, are the, also the same because the uh, atoms that are on it are both the oxygens. So that's fine. Then we have resonance. We're not going to have any resonance on that. So we're good off the resonance. And now we have dipole induction. So whenever we have dipole induction, uh, in this uh, on this first base, we have more dipole induction because the C is bonded to th the first carbon is bonded to three fluorine atoms. So if I drew this out like this, it has three fluorine atoms. All of them are pulling electron density towards them. Right. Dash CH2 dash O minus and a plus. So this is our molecule and those fluorines that are attached to that carbon are pulling electron density. And what that is actually causing, instead of causing this to be partially positive, because we have a charge on the uh, on this oxygen, 
this oxygen is instead of the carbon gaining a partially positive charge this oxygen is losing its negative charge so this oxygen is slowly like having a smaller and smaller minus charge right so the minus charge is a lot smaller compared to if we look at this one the ch3 ch2 o minus and a plus if you notice this oxygen is actually the one that's pulling electron density towards it right because whenever we have an electronegative atom uh, bonded to a carbon it's pulling electron density towards it so on the left side we see the fluorines are pulling some towards it even though the oxygen is also pulling some however the oxygen is charged so it's actually instead of uh causing it to be partially positive the oxygen is losing a lot more charge than it is uh, gaining, right? Which means that this is a worse base. This is a worse base because it has a um, because it has a smaller charge, which causes it to be more stable. So worse base because it's more stable, and then because the right hand side base is less stable. We have a stronger base on the right side. So we have a strong base and a strong acid on the right side. And so because we know that strong points at weak, our arrow is going to be pointing in the left direction. Uh, are there any questions on how I got that? Yes. What was that? So it would be a full arrow because this is a, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Because the half arrows are going to be for, uh, how, or not for how, uh, they're going to be for radicals, right? So this is going to be just the full arrow because it's charged. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Resonance. So resonance is going to be whenever we have like a positive or negative charge in the molecule, but that's whenever we have like double bonds as well so that we can move the double bonds around in the molecule. So in this one, uh, whenever we look at this, we can't really move any bonds around, right? So there's not going to be any resonance in any of the molecules. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. One more time. Sorry, I, I can't. You, oh, you mean like, does it matter if I put the strong base in the left box? It, it doesn't. You can, you can choose either box. I just decided to do it like that. I, th I think maybe like a point. But I mean, if anything, like uh, I, I would just suggest putting it on. It, it makes it a lot easier anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I, th I think it's just not that not a wrong. You you would get partial credit. All all of these questions, yeah, all of these questions. By the way, guys, all these questions do give you partial credit. So if you were to guess, like on the facts section, you guess like d don't guess two 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 because they're gonna count it completely wrong. But if you were to guess and you have no idea, you can't think your way through it. Just randomly putting three one two. That's completely fine. You you'll get uh, credit where you need. You know, so if you get only um, if you only get one of them right, you'll lose four points, but you have two points. So you always get partial credit on pretty much every single question, including nomenclature. So make sure just don't leave any blocks blank. Uh, any other questions? One more time. Where did I put conjugate base and conjugate acid? Why didn't I? Oh, okay. So in this, uh, it was just, just out of habit. Most of the time, I just determine which one is an acid, which one is a base. If I was going to show you like conjugate base, conjugate acid, I'll do it in orange right here. So this is going to be a uh, our regular acid. So this is going to be our first acid. And this is going to be its conjugate base conjugate base right so we have a weak acid and its conjugate base right here right 
And then we have our, let me see, color, okay, purple. And then we have our weak base, base, and it's conjugate acid right here. Does that make sense? So whenever uh, a sulfur base, whenever you have something that has a smaller charge, that means it's going to be more, uh, it's going to be less desiring for a proton, right? So if the, de the desire of that hydrogen is what causes it to be unstable, right? It wants that hydrogen to stabilize itself. If the charge is smaller, it doesn't need that hydrogen as much. When the charge is bigger, it's going to need that hydrogen a lot more to cause it to be stable. Does that make sense? So on the right side, this oxygen has a lot higher charge, right? Which means it needs that hydrogen to stabilize itself. Whereas the one on the left side, the oxygen has a smaller charge because of that dipole induction, that fl those fluorines that are pulling that electron density, that's causing it to have a smaller charge, which is making it uh, not as needing of a hydrogen. Right. Uh, any other questions? All right. <clears throat> okay, yeah. So now we have resonance contributors. So it's asking us for the structure given below. Draw the important resonant contributors. Circle the major contributor. So um, the first thing I like to do on these, uh, I'm not sure if she takes points off, but I just put brackets around the entire thing just so that just to make sure that all of this is shown as resonance and make sure whenever you're showing resonance, whenever you're showing different resonance structures, you always put the double sided arrows to show that they can go in between, right? And, and all of them, right? So now we have a uh, initial molecule with the minus charge on the carbon. So this, uh, this minus charge uh, and those uh, electrons can resonate to other parts of the molecule. So it has two ways it can go. Uh, there's one way is to the left and the second way to the right. So we have two ways, right? So we'll show the blue way first. So if it's going to the left. So if this charge was going to the left, this would cause this to become a double bond right here. And what this does is that it moves, it changes this oxygen double bond. It pull, it puts electrons onto the oxygen, so that the uh, this hydro because this carbon has a hydrogen, not it doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it. Sorry, this carbon, since it can't have a hydrogen attached to it, this has four bonds. If it had a if it had a hydrogen attached to it, it would have five bonds, which makes it which is just not it's not how hydro carbons work. So now uh, our first resonance structure is going to be that double bond forming. So whenever we would show that, we would show it like this. Excuse me? Uh, one more time. The lone pairs. Yeah, yeah it's important. It's good to draw the lone pairs if you want. Uh, I, I don't know if you'll get like points off for it. Uh, you, pr you probably won't, but it's just good practice too, just to make sure that like you have your valence electrons like, you know, memorized. It's, especially for this, it's uh, important. So this nitrogen has a lone pair on it, but this oxygen, because this double bond is now formed, this oxygen now, instead of having two lone pairs like it did before, so this oxygen prior had two lone pairs because it had charge zero, now has three lone pairs. So now that it has three lone pairs, this oxygen is now a minus charge. So that's going to be uh, the blue way, right? So there's only one uh, resonance to go onto the left side. Yeah. Yeah, you would still get credit. You should. Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, if you notice that there's a charge on it, then uh, I don't think they would take points off. I don't think they would take points off if you didn't put lone pairs either. Yeah, it didn't come, so. Uh, and then if you were going to resonate on the right side, which I'll do in red, um, 
we would have our double bond formed here. But notice that we, if we did our double bond on the right side, we'd have two double bonds right beside each other. So instead of this, uh, this double bond that was prior here is now going to move its lone pair on, uh, move its electron density onto that carbon, which is going to cause this other carbon to become minus charged. So what that looks like, it was, if we would just draw it like this. <clears throat> so this is one of our resonance structures as well. But notice now we have the same uh, minus charge and we have another double bond that can go to the right of it. So towards this nitrogen, which would pull uh, the nitrogen to have a uh, more lone pairs, an extra lone pair. So now we have one more resonance structure. So we can just draw that. One, two, three, four. So notice how the nitrogen has uh, four electrons on it, the hydrogen and the uh, bond to that carbon. So that means it has six total, uh, six total electron, like in terms of like the formal charge to calculate formal charge, it's going to be five minus six, right? So this is nitrogen is going to be having a minus one charge. So we can just say, I'll just put minus. So the nitrogen now has a minus charge. So now there's no more uh, resonance that we can do. If we were going to like go back like this nitrogen to have this electron density like this, we would just go back to this uh, prior structure, right? So that's the last um, that's the last thing we can do. So these are all the resonance contributors. Now it wants us to circle the major contributor. So whenever we're looking at major contributors, we're going to look at the charge that the um, the charge that every molecule has, right? So this uh, so between between this, we have an oxygen with the minus charge, we have a carbon with the minus charge, and a nitrogen with the minus charge. Sorry, wait. For first, we're going to look at which ones have octets. Okay, that's a better practice if we look at which ones have octets. So if you notice, uh, the carbons with the minus charges don't have full octets. That means they're not going to be our major contributors. So since we have these carbons with minus charges, they don't have a full octet, which means we won't be uh, uh, calling, we won't be referring to those as part of our major contributors. So it's between the oxygen and the nitrogen. So now we can look at the charges and we can see that uh, in both of them, we have full octets. And so this one of the oxygen with the minus charge, it's more electronegative, which means it takes that minus charge a lot more easily. It wants that minus charge more than the nitrogen would does. That means that our oxygen is going to be in a more uh, favorable, is going to be more favorable to have our oxygen to be having the minus charge in our resonance. So our oxygen is going to be our major contributor. So we can circle that with the oxygen with the minus charge. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, if you did, but I'm not sure that you would get that just because the way that resonance works is that the charge is always going to be present on the molecule. A positive charge, yeah. Uh, if we had a positive charge, we would have resonance. Uh, it would look along uh, something like this. So if we had the same thing, oh... NH like this, but this carbon was a plus charge right here instead. Instead of showing that the uh that like the way that we showed that this minus charge moved to form the double bond, we would show that this double bond moved to stabilize that positive charge. And instead of so like if we were gonna do it like this, we would have uh this with a plus charge on this carbon. This oxygen uh would be or no sorry on the oxygen. Do have a plus charge on the oxygen? Yeah, because this would still have the double bond. And then we have this NH like that. And it would be the same way going the other way. So like 
this would come stabilize this, and then whenever that would go, this one would have a positive charge, and then yeah, like that exactly. And the positive charge would just bump bounce around the same way. Uh, any other questions? And you would go the same way as like finding the major contributor. Which one has the wants the positive charge the most? In this case, if it had the positive charge, the nitrogen wants the positive charge more than the oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think it's beneficial if you draw errors. I'm not sure if they I don't, I'm not sure if they take points off, but um I mean I don't grade it, you know. But uh it's it it, it would help you and probably the grader to show that you had errors. Yeah. What was that? Yeah, so uh because the oxygen is more uh so oxygen is more electronegative, right? So that means that it wants that negative charge more than the nitrogen would. So then because the if the nitrogen had it, it would be a lot more unstable than the oxygen would be. So that oxygen is going to be uh better suited to the negative charge. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the only reason. Otherwise, the full the octets are full. Everything is fine. It's just between the two molecules. <coughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right. Uh, moving on. So this number nine. It's saying consider the structure. Wait. How much? Okay. Number nine. Consider the structure below and answer the following questions. So wait. How much time do we have? Okay. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So we want to, uh, so these boxes are asking us to find the hybridization of each of these uh, atoms, right? So for us, it might just be easy to just go straight up. Just look at this. This has one, two, two lone pairs, and then the two bonds, which makes it sp3, right? If we, if we just did that, we would neglect uh, resonance in this. So you notice that we have a charge right here, which means that we have resonance to go. So whenever we have these uh, hybridization questions, a lot of the time you're going to have to do resonance so that you can find the proper hybridization of each of the molecules. So remember that uh, this molecule never actually exists. I think she said in lecture, the molecule never exists, but the hybrid does. Like the, the same way, like the bonds are always like always moving around, right? So that's this, this is exactly what we're trying to show here. So this hybridization, even though on paper it looks sp3, if we did resonance, you'd see that it would have a different hybridization. So I'll show resonance right here. So we'll move this do uh, double bond first. So we have something like this, OCH3 double bond right here. And H... So this is going to be our structure and notice how this carbon lost a bond, right? So that, uh, that positive charge moves onto that carbon. So we'll just draw it like that. And now we actually have another way we can do resonance. This oxygen, sorry, this oxygen has lone pairs that it can use to stabilize that, uh, positive charge. So it's going to, so we have another resonance structure to draw. OCH3 plus charge on the oxygen now. Okay. And so now we have all of our resonance structures drawn because there's no other resonance that we can do with the molecule. So, uh, one thing also to note, um, some, some of you guys might, uh, like, May like on the exam, you, you might see this and say that this can come and stabilize this. What you want to make sure to do with resonance is that it's only going to go one carbon over. So one carbon at a time. So if this was going to be stabilizing anything, it would be something over here or something over here. It's not going to jump a carbon to stabilize something else. Okay. So just, just something to take note of for the exam. So um, in this structure, we have the two resonance contributors. So in this in this first drawn structure, this oxygen has an sp3 hybrid, is sp3 hybridized, right? So it has the two lone pairs and the uh, two bonds. So the way you would count is O here. 
the way you would count is bonds. Uh, so it's S, then PPP. So every bond is going to have a character to it. So this is going to be, let's call this the S bond. This We'll call this the P bond. And then these lone pairs are each going to have a P of their own. So PPP. So S, P, 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 this is going to be SP3 hybridized, right? And it's the same way in, thi in this molecule right up here. It's the, sa it's the same oxygen. But if we go down here, we see this oxygen now only has one lone pair, which means that we have this S, uh, oxygen, CH3, and then the lone pair. If we look at this, we have S, P. Remember, double bonds only count as one uh, like letter. So this double bond is only going to be one P. And then this double, uh, this lone pair is going to be another P. So this oxygen is actually sp2 hybridized. So our answer in this box is going to be sp2. And we're going to move on. We're going to do it the same to the other, uh, to this one. So in this molecule, this is sp3 hybridized. This carbon, right? Because it has the, it would have its two bonds, and then these two bonds right here, sppp. But whenever we look at the one which has this as a, um has a double bond on it. This would have one hydrogen on it. If we look at this, S, P, P. So this uh, carbon is also SP2 hybridized. <laughs> then we go on. This carbon right here is gonna be SP3 because it doesn't change at all during the, um, it doesn't change at all in the uh, resonance structures. So this is just gonna be just straight how it is. And the same, go same goes for this because this has S and P, it has two double bonds, S and P. So this carbon in the middle, CB, is going to be SP hybridized. So that's going to be our answer for part A. Next, it's asking, ask, asking, asking us, what is the N-CA-CB bond angle? So uh, this is just one thing that you guys have to know. If something is SP3 hybridized, if something is SP3, this is going to be a tetrahedral molecule. So all you have to know about this is that tetrahedral or sp3 has a 109.5 degree bond angle. This is important to know because this is the only way, not the only way, but this is like the main way you would be answering questions like this, number B. sp2, this is going to be a planar molecule. This is going to have 120 degree bond angles. And then sp hybridized are going to be, um, uh, they're going to be linear. And these are going to have 180 degree bond angles. Right? So now we have, it's asking us, what is the N-CACB bond angle? So we're going to be looking at the center of carbon. So whichever one's going to be in the center here, it's going to tell us the, the hybridization of the center is going to tell us the angle of the bonds in the middle. Like, for example, if we we're going to have something, this angle right here, like between a b and c this angle b is going to be uh, is going to be based on where b is right it's not going to be ba like it's not going to be based on where a is or c is it's going to be based on the center so we look at ca so our ca this if we look at this this is a s uh if we draw it out I, i'll draw it out c double bond to another c has a h bond and then it has a nitrogen bond and that's it. No lone pairs, no other hydrogens. So this is going to be SP P hybridized. So SP2 hybridized, right? So our CA is SP2. And remember, whenever we have SP2, we have a planar molecule, which has a 120 degree bond angle. So the bond angle between uh, NC, uh, the NCC is going to be our 120 degrees. The next uh, C the sigma bond between the atoms labeled C and D is formed by the overlap of what types of orbitals? So this question is a little, uh, it looks a little bit daunting, but it's a lot easier than you think. This is essentially just asking you the hybridization of the two molecules that you that it's asking you about. So it's asking you about the C and D molecules, right? These two molecules right here, between C and D, we have two different hybridizations. This C molecule is sp3 hybridized. Right, it has the three hydrogens coming out, so it has SPPP, SP3. This D molecule has one, two, and three, so this is going to be SP2 hybridized. Right, so we know the two bond angle, we know the two hybridizations. 
Now, since we know that, we just put that into the box. SP3 dash SP2. That's it. All right. Yeah. Yeah, NCA and CB. That's uh, that's asking for uh, this bond angle right here. This. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for this one, it's gonna always gonna have three, right? So whenever you have three molecules, you're only gonna be determining uh, the angle based on the one in the center. Yeah, the center, right? So for C, you're only gonna be showing the hybridization of the two uh, the two molecules it's asking for. It's very easy. It's uh, it asks like a lot of big words, but it's very simple in essence. So now D, are the hydrogen atoms labeled in A and B in the same plane or in different planes? Right, same or different in the box. So whenever we have double bonds, uh, what we can look at is the way that they're uh, organized, okay? So this is gonna be uh, a little bit of a 3D kind of lesson. Uh, just like stay with me, right? So every carbon or every molecule has, every molecule has um, different orbitals, right? It has the X orbital, the Y orbital, and the Z orbital, right? So if I was going to be drawing one carbon, this carbon has the X orbital like this, right? The Y orbital and the Z orbital. So all of these orbitals, they can have electron, they can have electrons in there, right? So whenever we, whenever it's asking us something like this, it's asking us if the hydrogens are sharing, if they're sharing electrons pretty much. If this is, uh, if this was going to be in the same plane, these carbons, for example, these carbons would have, um, like if the hydrogens were right here and then we had a different, like this is, okay, think about this. This is just the X, uh, X orbital, right? If we had this bond and then this bond right here, they're both in the X orbital, which means they would have the same orbital, right? Whenever we have double bonds, we're going to be going in uh, a different way a little bit. So if I was going to be drawing all the X orbitals for this, right, this, okay, so we have this first carbon, CH, right? We have one hydrogen in there, but it's double bonded to carbon C. So let's just say we made that double bond into the, um, we made that double bond uh, shown in these orbitals, right? The way we would do that, just form this line right here, and we also have to form this line right here, right? Because it's a double bond. So both of the uh, both of the x orbitals are being taken up, taken up, right? So now this carbon, this third carbon, can't take any of these electro uh, any of these bonds, right? So that bond cannot ever be made just because that uh, orbital is completely filled with the other carbon's bonds. So this carbon has to have a different uh, area for this carbon to have its electron pair, right? So we went from, um, we went from the X orbital between the first and second carbon to the Y orbital and the second and third carbon, right? So the second and third carbon, they have different orbital, like their electrons are going in this way compared to the, this vertical way that the uh, first two electrons are going through. Does that make sense? So because it has two double bonds, those can't be in the same way. If there were two single bonds like this, the same way, this would uh, be sh this would be technically they would be in the same plane, right? So uh, what it would look like on like paper, it would be like C single bond C single bond C like that. So they'd be in the same. But since it's double bond like this, this causes it to be uh, like this carbon and this carbon have to be like this. And so that uh, these are these are where the hydro, uh, the electrons are formed, and then the other carbon has to have it on the other side like this. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. If it was a double bond and a single bond, it would be the same principle. It would just be that it wouldn't be double like this. So if I had your good question though, 
C double bond C single bond C like this. This would be still still held, right? This would be held and this would be held. But now this single bond C can't take can't take this like this, right? Because these are already taken. So now it has to go the same way that the other bond went. It's just that it can just go like this just one time. Yeah, it's always going to be in a different plane, pretty much. Yes. Any other questions? So in this in this question, they'd be in different planes. So D. Hmm. Yeah. Double bond for single bond, it would still be D. If it was single bond, single bond, they would be a, a same. Yeah. One more time. What about a triple bond? Since it's linear, uh, it's it's gonna be the same, or not same. If it was a triple bond, I'm actually not sure. I see that's a good question. I don't I don't know how to answer that. I've never looked at like the um the hybridization of like triple bonds like that, but I'd assume it'd be in, uh I'd assume it'd be different. It's, yeah. Yeah. C. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would. So in this one, uh, we didn't have to consider resonance just because the say they're um, neither of those are resonating much, right? So because of that, they're both just be sp three, sp two. But if there was something that you would uh, look at the resonance of, you would use that uh, the most stable hybridization. So if it asks like oxygen and this uh, carbon, it'd be sp two, sp two, right? Uh, any other questions? All right, uh, next one. <clears throat> now, viewing the molecule along the C4C5 bond, construct the Newman projection of the most stable conformation of the 4,5 diethyl octane. So we want, the, uh, we want the molecule along 4 and 5. So 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we want it between 4 and 5, so I'll draw a line right here. So that's the way we're going to be looking at it. Remember Newman, Newman projections, we're moving the molecule from a 2D. My bad, guys. Whenever we have a, um, whenever we have a 2D molecule, whenever, we, uh, whenever we're doing a Newman projection, we're changing that 2D to, into a 3D like this, right? So we want that to stack on top of each other. So whenever we have that, uh, what I like to do is just draw like the circle first. And or actually, I like to I like to draw this um the dot first, and then just just draw out the um the constituents on each of this. So on this one, I'm gonna look at the dot as four, and the circle is five, right? So if the dot was on four, four has a ethyl group on it. So I'll just write CH two CH three, and then it also has this uh, hydrogen on it. So I'll put H right here. And then uh, on this side, I'll put our this big group, which is our butyl. Um, CH2, CH2, CH3. CH2, CH2, CH3. So that's our group. I don't know why I drew it really like that. My bad, guys. CH2, CH2, CH3. So now that we have all of that, now we can look at uh, what the circle molecule has. So the circle molecule has... The same CH two CH three. Then uh, it has the hydrogen on it as well, and it also has the CH two CH two CH three. So whenever we're crafting the most stable Newman projection, we want to put the biggest groups across from each other first, right? So if I was going to start like this, I'll just put an arrow up. I know the biggest group is this group right here, CH two CH two CH three, right? CH2, CH2, CH3. So I've drawn that. That's our biggest group on the carbon four. Now we want to draw the biggest group on the carbon five completely across from that. So we'll draw it like this. So we'll just put it right behind it. CH2, CH2, CH3. And that's our two uh, biggest groups gone. Now, since it's asking for, uh, I should have said this before, it can ask also for the least stable. And that means you're going to want it to be eclipsed. Right, you guys know what, how eclipse would look. Yeah, I'll show. I'll draw both. This is going to be the most stable first. So I'll draw the most stable, and then I'll show you guys how to draw the eclipse one. So, uh, 
This is, uh, we have our two biggest groups across from each other. Then we want our two second biggest groups also across from each other. So uh, I'll uh, remember we have three ways. So we can, we're going to use like the, like a pie method. So we're going to like cut it into like, a, what is this? Like Venn, not Venn diagram, but like in the thirds, we're going to cut it into thirds, right? And so on one of them, we'll put CH2, CH3. And then across from that completely from the backside, we'll put CH2, CH3 as well. And then on the other side, we only have hydrogens left. So we'll put hydrogen and hydrogen. And so this is going to be our most stable conformation. So one other thing that Dr. Bean can ask you is going to ask you for the least stable. So whenever you want least stable conformation, you're going to want an eclipse conformation rather than a staggered one. So what that looks like is you would do the same thing. Let's say you put uh, CH2, CH2, CH3 right here. Let's say you did that. Now, uh, all you would do is just put an eclipse thing right behind it, like the C5, and then put the same big group on the other side, CH2, CH2, CH3. This is because both of these groups are going to contribute to like a bunch of steric hindrance. So it's going to be super unstable if it was going to be in this conformation. And be the same way that we go the other way, CH2, C CH2, or CH2, CH3, and then uh, same way, CH2, CH3. It's essentially just matching, right? H and H. So that's going to be our least stable confirmation. If we did it eclipsed and have it the same, yes. That's going to be, yeah, that's going to be staggered. So this is eclipsed. This is the way you guys are going to, holy sh. This is the way you guys are going to be sitting in the test. So you guys are going to be sitting in like eclipse confirmation in the rooms. Eclipsed and staggered. All right. Uh, any questions on that? So staggered is going to give you your most stable one and your eclipse is going to give you your least stable confirmation. Yeah. What was that? The step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Technically, yeah, it would. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Can I show? Yeah, this is the eclipse one to the right, right here. That's the one. Yes. Yeah, this is essentially eclipse is going to be our least stable confirmation and you're just going to want to match up the biggest groups uh, like to each other. Right. And so the last ones that we have are the hydrogens. We just have to put those like right beside. Yeah. I don't I don't think uh, I've ever seen a question about bond energy on the exam. Yeah. She might ask, like, which one had the has the highest bond association energy, but I don't think that would be on this exam at all. That's going to be in later exams. It would just ask you, like, to rate them, not, like, to calculate them. Does that make sense? To rate, like, in terms of, like, one, two, three, the same way you did, like, above. Yeah, like, instead of, like, rank these in highest acidity, rank these in, like, highest bond association energy. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, if you have, all, as long as you have them across from each other, it doesn't matter how you draw them. As long as they're across and they're correct, you'll get full credit. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, second last one? Yes, second last one. Okay. So draw the more stable confirmation for each of the substituted cyclohexane shown below. So in this one, uh, we're supposed, we need to draw two different uh, chair structures. So we have A and B. So whenever we're drawing chair structures, uh, I'll just draw two chairs right here.
Yeah, for these ones, you are going to have to draw chair structures just to find out which one is going to be more stable or like this, how to find the most stable one, right? So we have um, one chair and draw the second one. I need to draw these. I'm going to draw these a little bit bigger, actually. Okay, so what I'm going to draw first are going to be all of the potential uh, ways that a chair can be drawn or all the way the bonds can be portrayed on a tray, a chair. So uh, this is just uh, this blue is just showing you guys the way that the bonds are going to look right. So. Uh, we have our equatorial and axial positions on all of these. Uh, one thing, if you guys are having trouble, like remembering which one's going to be axial or uh, equatorial, every axial position uh, is going to alternate. So if you have one axial position going up, the next one is going to be going down and so on. Right. So if I drew it on this one, axial up, axial down, axial up, axial down, axial up. Or I miss I missed one axial up, axial down. Right. And then you can just fill out the equatorial positions. It's like a easy way just to make sure that you have a proper chair structure. Then uh, for the first thing we're going to do, uh, this is where I was talking about the biggest group is going to take the highest priority. So uh, we have uh, two methyl groups on each of them, and then we have a T-butyl group on uh, on this. So this CCH33 is a T-butyl group. So I'm going to uh, try to color code these just so that it's easy, uh, very like easy to determine. So I'll put this in purple. So our um t so our biggest group we always want that biggest group to be on an equatorial position. So it doesn't matter how we do it. We just want it to be equatorial. It doesn't matter if you want to put it equatorial uh going like this, or like this, or like this. So there's three equatorial positions we can put it at. All of them would be fine. Just because this is on a wedge, we have to make it face up. So all of these facing up ones are going to be completely valid candidates to have our equatorial position for uh, for simplicity. I like to just put it on like one of the edge ones. So I'll put it on this uh, bottom carbon. So this carbon, I'm going to put our uh, our chicken foot. So now we have our uh, biggest group. Now what we can do is we can just start numbering the carbons one, two, three, four across the uh, cyclohexane. And we can do the same through to the uh, uh, to the chair structure. So it doesn't matter which way we count from. It, we can just start counting. So I'll count uh, left one, two, three, four, five, and six. It doesn't matter how you would count. Both of them are going to give you the right answer as long as you put the um, the biggest group exactly where it needs to be on an equatorial position in the same orientation that it's shown on the structure, right? So on carbon three. We have a methyl group facing down. So on this carbon, we have this methyl group facing down. CH, oh, not purple, sorry. So I'll use green for this. So we have a green car, uh, CH3 group facing down. And then on carbon four, we have a, uh, we have this uh, blue CH3 group facing up. So this is CH3. I probably should have chosen better color, but I guess. Uh, so that's what we have. So we have our CH3 facing up. Now, uh, this is going to be our most stable uh, confirmation for this because the biggest group is on the equatorial position. So whatever we just drew here, we can just go ahead and take that just into this box. Right. Oh, here, wait, hold up. Yes. Uh, it's better to draw the chair structure. I think I think in this question you have to draw the chair structure for this. Yeah. The. Oh yeah, you can yeah you can just write it. You don't have you don't have to put the yeah I was, I just that's just me sorry. And then uh further uh going to the next one so this is gonna be our most stable confirmation right, so on to the next one if we do the same way, 
uh, on this one, um, if we just, I'm just gonna color code it real quick before I go. Um, it doesn't matter which one we do it on. So now we just want an equatorial position facing up for this uh, chicken foot, right? So an equatorial position facing up, that could be this one, that could be this one, and that could be this one. So all those are valid, whichever one you wanna do. Uh, I'll do it on this one, just to show some. So we have this one. Uh, now this is gonna be carbon one. If we just number this one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, whenever we do this, we can just do the same thing that we did to the other one. So now our methyl group is facing up on uh, carbon three and the facing up on carbon three is on an equatorial position. So we'll do the CH3 and then on carbon four, we have something facing up in, uh, so this is gonna be in the axial position though. So CH3. So now this is gonna be our most stable, uh, our most stable one for this uh, question. So. Right, so these are gonna be, uh, what the question was asking are most stable um, conformations for the following, um, for the cyclohexanes, right? And then next it's asking us which isomer is mo more stable, A or B. So uh, the one thing that we need to take note of in here is that the most stable isomer is gonna have more uh, substituents on equatorial positions. So we want more equatorial. So if we just count this, we have one equatorial position and then two axial. And on the right one, we have two on equatorial positions and one on an axial position, right? So because these are the most stable ones, uh, these are gonna be the only ones you're gonna be determining in between. We don't have to draw any more chair structures or anything, that's it, right? So we drew these chair structures and now we just see that uh, the one, number B has, um, the uh, has more substituents on equatorial positions. That means the isomer is going to be more stable. So uh, for number uh, for part B of this question, uh, the isomer that's more stable is B. Uh, are there any questions on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't matter the way you number it. If I numbered it the other way, like if I numbered this one, two, three, four, five, six, I'd still get the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we just look at like which ones are equatorial and then whichever one has more is more stable. Yeah, we always we always want to start with that. And once we start with that, we'll have the most stable confirmation as long as you do everything else correctly. If it, uh, you would never you wouldn't have that just in these questions, they're always going to make sure that you have the difference between two equator like more equatorials and less equatorials on this question particularly. Yeah. You would get to that this naming later because it has three. It would be it would be between R and S. Yeah. So, uh, are you guys over R and S yet? Okay. Yeah. So if you just started, it's not gonna be on this exam then. Yeah. So, it, it, you would have different steer. Yeah. There's <laughs> don't worry. There's different ways to determine stereochemistry. This one in this case it would be R and S, but you don't have to worry about that. That's next exam. Yeah, it's just trans assist. That's all you have to know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Hmm? Yeah, last one. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yeah. And the rest of the what? Uh, no. 
You don't have to. Uh, honestly, uh, it would be better if you didn't also draw the lines in your final structure, just in case they think it's like a methyl group, you know. But like, uh, I just did it because it's uh, like you know, it's colored. Like, but on your exam, you're gonna be using pencil. So. If you would, you have to what? Uh, it's up to you. However, you want to do it. Uh, no, no, point, points are going to be the same. As long as you have the right uh, substituents on the right ones, you're going to be fine, right? Yeah. Hydrogens, yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, that is fine. Just, yeah, if you were going to draw these lines, just make sure you put hydrogen on them. Yeah, yeah, just, just put hydrogen on them. Otherwise, just don't put the lines. It's no worries. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be assumed anyway. Yeah, if it clock, yeah, that that's also a good point that maybe they they might misgrade it. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, last question. So, provide the propagation steps in the mechanism that explains the formation of one of the pro uh, of the products in the reaction below. So, um, in this one, uh, it's asking us for the propagation steps. So we have uh. Three uh, in halogenation, we have or radicalization, I guess we have three uh, steps, right? We have initiation, propagation, and then we have termination. All it wants in this question is the propagation step. So whenever we have initiation, uh, just remember that uh, we're we're starting with this Br two, right? So this Br2 is going to be uh, coming apart. So Br dash Br. So it's going to be coming apart like this. So this is going to be like our uh, our um, initiation step, right? That Br2 comes uh, comes apart to form two uh, two radicals, right? I think that's what you're talking about about the half arrows, right? So this is this is where we use the half arrows. So in this one, uh, we're going to show uh, so we're going to show this. Like, um, okay, first let's talk about the, this equation. So we have a four carbon chain with a methyl attached to it, a plus Br2 in light. Uh, it forms a uh, tertiary brom uh, tertiary halide, right? On the, bromate, on the bromine. So because we have this, it's essentially just saying that this hydrogen that this was bonded to is no longer there and it was replaced with the bromine, right? And then that bromine uh, took a hydrogen. So this bromine, has a hydrogen. So essentially with the propagation steps, we're going to be forming both of those products in that uh, in like um, half step kind of uh, formation. So I'll show you how, how we can do that. So remember initiation step, we've already established the radicals, right? So we will start CH3, CH, uh, CH3, CH2, CH3 plus BR. And this is the radical. Right. And that's going to uh, what that's going to do. We have for this, we have to draw arrows. So remember that every bond has two electrons, right? So uh, the way we're going to draw this is that this electron right here is going to uh, is going to half arrow to the middle. And this bromine is going to half arrow immediate meet it as well. So what happens? This is the only like uh, mechanism part that we have to show for the half arrows like this. <laughs> it's not the only one, sorry. We also have to show where this uh, electron goes, this bottom one right here. So because it's like a, a lone electron, we have to show that it for uh, like we have to show that it's going to be on this carbon and that's going to be another half arrow that I failed at drawing. So it's going to um, it's going to be another half arrow. It's just going to point it at the carbon so that it shows that the carbon now has the radical. Right. And so now what we have is that we have it, our HBR. And this uh, this carbon chain with the radical on it now. So our new carbon chain, CH, CH3, C, uh, CH2, CH3, CH3. But now it has that, that damn radical. Then we have plus uh, our HBR. So now we've formed one of our products, right? So now what we have to do is we take this product right here, this uh, I'll underline it in red. 
we take this product and this is going to be our react reactant for the next propagation step. So we're going to do CH3 C with that uh, radical CH2 CH3 bonded to CH3. Right. And that's going to be going to plus. Uh, we're not going to use BR radical this time. So in uh, what I've noticed in most of these uh, kind of radical questions, you're going to pretty much mo all the time have three arrows, right? So if we were just going to do BR like this, like this radical, we would just have two arrows, right? Two half arrows, and that would be, that would be the end of it, right? But since like uh, we're supposed to, what I've, what I've noticed is that we're supposed to have three. So we're actually going to do this. Uh, we're going to have these two BR. We're going to have BR2 instead. And the way we're going to just do this, we're just going to put one um, of the bromines to have uh, a radical on it. And this this electron is going to go into the center the same way this radical will. And so it's going to show that this, brom this bromine, um, this bromine right here is now bonded to that carbon. And this bromine now has a radical on it, right? Because we also have to show, because there's also the termination step. And in the termination step, what we have is the two bromines uh, bonding to each other, causing it to be just BR2, right? So we have to show that we have a BR radical to be left behind, right? That's, that's another reason. So then our final product, CH3C bind to the bromine, CH3, CH2, CH3 plus our bromine radical. Uh, are there, that's it actually. So are there any other questions on this? Yeah, that's just the propagation step. Yeah. Because the bromine radical is so reactive that you're more likely to get an actual reaction with the bromine uh, diazeolide instead of just a BR radical. So yeah. So the yeah radical. the bromine is always going to be like reacting with something. So if it's just a bromine radical, so it'd be more likely that the bromine would uh, rebond to that other bromine before it bonds to that carbon. This whole thing is answered. I think it'd be, if it's six points, it'd be like three points per line. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He goes BR2. Yeah. 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 Unless it asks you for the termination step, you're not going to do it. Yeah. Yes. No, the BR2 is two bromines that are like bonded together like, like this. The BR radical is just a single bromine with like an uh with an unpaired electron in it. That's the radical. Here, wait, give me one second. I'm gonna end the recording and then I'll talk to you. Uh, here, wait, just come up and then uh, we can talk. I can't, I can't hear you right now. I'm sorry. <laughs>